um, uh, uh, gentlemen, it's uh, great, uh, great to see you here, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's start the session. There we are. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for uh, joining us today, uh, the second day of the conference. And uh, we're glad to be kicking off the morning by framing a lot of the discussions that are going to follow on uh, the rest of the day and into the evening, uh, even India. So uh, just to kind of set the conversation a little bit around the global economic issue, uh, obviously, the global economy, our economy is not great right now. Uh, the IMF in April projected that uh, the world economy would dip 3% this year, but huge drops in 7.5% of the Eurozone, 6.5% in the UK, 5.2% in Japan, 4.9% in China, uh, just across the board. Uh, world Trade Organization expects global trade to drop 13% to 32%. That's a huge range, by the way, uh, depending on your assumptions this year. And then the most recent forecast, which is actually by the uh, World Bank, uh, is a bit more pessimistic. They think the global economy will drop 5.2% this year. So that affects trade. Obviously, it affects investment. Uh, it's impacting startups, venture investment. We've seen upwards of 30,000 layoffs, probably more now by uh, startup and early stage companies. And even though there's a lot of venture investment available, a lot of uh, companies are keeping their powder dry. They're being very selective about where to send it in this environment. So a very tough time, uh, but not necessarily uh, a tough time for innovation because innovation tends to happen most in uh, in challenging times. And this is certainly one. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunity now for people in the technology and the startup and the venture community to pivot, to confront the new challenges and really maybe create great companies and solutions out of that. So to get the conversation going, uh, as you heard, we have three absolutely fantastic panelists to, uh, to talk about this. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Bashara Kusher, who's the senior vice president and the chief health officer for Kaiser Permanente, just to frame the conversation around like what is actually going on with COVID and what should we expect over the next four, six months, three years. Uh, we'll go to Vish Mesra, who are gonna talk about it a bit more from a venture perspective. And then we'll go to Brenda Santoro from Silicon Valley Bank, who will talk with us about what she's seeing of the portfolio companies there uh, in the startup world. So uh, we'll start with you, Bashar. And I think when all this began, when we started to shut down in California in March, you know, a lot of people thought, well, we'll shut down for three or four weeks, then we're going to come back and people will be re rehired from the furlough. We'll have a big V-shaped recovery and not much will have changed. So that didn't happen. So I guess the upfront question is, why is the process of getting back to normal such an extended process and if you're a, or a business person you're an investor you're looking at uh, like what to expect from your economic environment going forward uh, what do you think is driving the COVID crisis right now and how do, long do you think it's going to take us economically to get back to something close to what a lot of us might recognize as, as normal well, um, thank you, Sean, for uh, inviting me and uh, Vish and Brenda. It's great to be with you uh, on the panel um, this morning. I think, Sean, to answer your question, it's probably good to put this pandemic in a context of what is it that we know um, about pandemics. Um, you know, I'm a public health person. I'm a physician by training, but I spent most of my career in public health. I um, led the Chicago Department of Public Health and the midst of the H1N1 pandemic, the, the, um, the Ebola um, outbreak. And, and the reality is most of what we know about pandemics, we learned from previous pandemics. And, and we've had a series of pandemics over the history of this world that's been, that have been fairly well documented. And when you think of a pandemic, you think about four concrete phases and understanding those different phases is critical to think about how we respond 
from an economic perspective, from an innovation perspective. So let me just kind of very quickly walk through these different four, four phases. So when a novel um, um, infection comes out, when a novel virus shows up and we have this outbreak, the first phase you'd wanna do is you wanna try to contain that, that outbreak. And you'd wanna try to contain it by identifying people who are positive, try to isolate them, and try to quarantine people who've been exposed to the uh, to the virus, and you'd hope that you'd be able to stop the outbreak right then. Now, the reality is when you get to a point where all these containment efforts are not effective anymore, you're going to start having a lot more community spread. And we've seen that um, in China, we've seen it in the United States, we've seen it across the world, where there is a lot more community spread that those community containment efforts will fail. Uh, then because you'd have a lot more infections, you just simply can't contact, trace everybody, isolate everybody who's positive and quarantine those who've been exposed. So it's really critical as we think about in the mitigation phase, that's that second phase, when your systems are, are overwhelmed with new infections, that's when you have to try to do everything you can to slow that community spread. And you wanna slow that so that you can prepare your healthcare system to be able to get a lot more increases in number of people who are gonna need to be hospitalized, need to be in ICU. And that's what we've seen over the last few months. You know, We've put these measures in place that started by closing schools, stopping all these major events, big events in the communities. Then in many places, we went into complete lockdown or shelter in place orders. And really all what you're trying to do is you're trying to slow the community spread so you can give your healthcare system enough time to stand up for the increased number of cases that they're gonna see. And you'd hope you gain more time to develop a vaccine or have an effective, effective treatment. And we've seen these measures work in the United States and across the world. We, um, you know, um, we, we've seen uh, specifically in the early phases of these measures, a significant decrease in the number um, um, of, of new cases. Now that the economies are starting to be opened up again, we're starting to see an uptick you know, in, in many of the communities. In theory, when these mitigation measures work, you and the number of new cases start going down again and become manageable again, then you move into the third phase of any type of pandemic, which is around suppressing the pandemic. And really the basic of suppressing a pandemic goes back to a lot of testing, identifying people who are testing positive, isolating those, doing contact tracing for those folks who've been exposed to people who've been testing positive and then quarantine those, those individuals. And you'd hope and you'd want that if your, your testing is up to speed, your contact tracing efforts is up to speed, that you'll be able to contain and suppress the pandemic um, at, that, um, at that stage. And then eventually you'd wanna move to the fourth phase, which is really focused on prevention. And that's when you'd hope that you have an effective safe vaccine that you can put into people's bodies um, and hopefully be able to prevent that um, um, any future um, um, impact of that of that pandemic. The reality is right now we were in the mitigation phase. We're starting to see decreases in number of cases. We're getting ready to get move into the suppression phase where you start doing excessive tests, um, uh, broad testing, contact tracing, the reality, though, with the economy opening up and people are starting to be out again, we're starting to see uptick in number of new cases. So we might be going back and forth between the suppression phase and the mitigation phase until we get to a point where we have a really good handle on, um, on the pandemic. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to move to um, um, suppression phase and then the, the prevention phase. The only, And then I'll conclude by saying this, Sean, the only way... Um, that we're, on a, we're gonna be able to get out of the pandemic effectively is by making sure that we have a vaccine that's effective, that's safe, and that we, are, can, we can get it into the bodies of billions of people across the country and the world. So tons of opportunities for innovation, but I think to understand how we respond in a pandemic, 
it's really important to understand how do pandemic behave. So I hope that was a, a good way to frame the, the economic discussion that's going to happen for the rest of the roundtable. Yeah, that was great, Bashar. Thank you. Maybe a quick follow-up question to that. Sort of, given that our audience includes a lot of global investors, there are obviously technological challenges or opportunities here. Uh, we're seeing tech companies really coming on around contact tracing, using lots of big data, lots of work ongoing on vaccines, on a range of treatments. So, you know, people he is a, a big consumer of these kinds of technologies and services. Uh, if you had a room full of investors, which you do, and startups, where do you think that uh, the greatest interest, the greatest need will be uh, as a technology consumer for uh, new technologies and new investments that are going to help us address the COVID issue, but maybe even uh, some of these challenges uh, beyond COVID? Well, l let me start by just talking about vaccines just very briefly. Um, you know, again, there's no way we're going to be able to suppress this pandemic and prevent any further outbreaks and, and surges until we get a vaccine that's effective, that's safe, and that we can get it to the bodies of billions and billions of people across the world. So as you think about that, we have a lot of energy and effort right now at getting into that type of a vaccine. I think as of my latest reading here, we have about a hundred efforts to develop vaccines. I think about eight of those are already in clinical trials. So that's a good, um, that's a good sign there. And, um, you know, a few of them will probably be successful at identifying the right type of vaccine. Um, again, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to be in the business of predicting, but there would be a possibility that by the end of the year or early 2021, we would have identified a vaccine that's effective. Um, hopefully we would have done enough uh, testing, um, enough testing of the vaccine, enough clinical trials, tens of thousands of people participate in those trials to get us to the safety, safety component. If you think about it, we're shooting constantly at this goalpost. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to score, um, you know, in, in, um, in one of these shots. The reality, though, is we need to be really realistic about expectations. When you look at previous vaccine history, it usually takes the fastest vaccine that we were able, able to develop took four to five years. So we're being really optimistic by saying we'll have a vaccine that's safe and effective by the end of this year or early 2021. But let's say we got there, and I'm hoping we will get there in early 2021. Then you have to figure out how are you going to be able to the, to get it to the bodies of literally billions and billions of people across the world. And think about all the logistics that are associated with that. I mean, we've been struggling with uh, uh, personal protective equipments, with swabs, with all of the stuff for the surges that we're dealing with right now on a smaller level. So think about you know, all the vials that you're going to need to be able to get that vaccine out, the alcohol swabs, the needles. I mean, there's tons and tons of logistics that are going to be really critical to get us into that vaccine that's safe, that's effective, and that's being administered to billions and billions of people in the world. So vaccines is a huge opportunity to think about that. And let me just pause for a minute about contact tracing, because contact tracing is another is really our best bet until we have that vaccine. Really, it's our best bet for us to be able to suppress uh, to suppress the pandemic. And when you look globally, you see some countries have done a really good job at identifying new strategies, new um, techniques, leveraging technology to be able to um, identify people who are testing positive, identify those who have been exposed to these people for 10 or 15 minutes in the last um, you know, 10 days or so. So it's really important that we think about how we're gonna leverage the technology and the space, knowing very well though, that at the basic core basis of contact tracing is really shoe leather epidemiology. You find people who are testing positive, then you literally call them, talk to them in person over the phone, over video and try to identify their contacts reach out to their contacts, do your assessments there, and eventually quarantine their contacts, uh, contacts and then um, getting them tested. So lots of opportunities for innovation there. 
Um, and I have to say, I mean, uh, you know, the public health community have done contact tracing for over 100 years. We know how to do it. It's just we've never done it at this scale that we're talking about. Um, uh, you know, for the United States, we anticipate we're going to need anywhere between 100,000 to 300,000 tracers to be able to do this job. And there are tons of opportunities for innovation there. So I'll, I'll stop here just to kind of get the teasers here out there as to why innovation is so critical in this stage. Thanks, Bashar. That was a great setup. Uh, so we'll, we'll turn to you now, Vish. So putting on your investor hat, uh, when you look at that, that landscape, uh, what do you see in terms of challenges, opportunities? You know, we have issues that have come up through COVID-19 around supply chain. Uh, uh, so what's your perspective? So, uh, you know, um, just as a kind of historical perspective, uh, when, you, when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship, um, I think uh, we all know, and uh, we got examples galore, most innovations have occurred during you know, stressful times. And the sustainable company that have been built during uh, the, the hardest of the times. And what happens, you know, and, and this is a message for all the entrepreneurs, just because the times are good, or you just, people just don't become smart all of a sudden just because times are good, okay? Or just because the times are bad, people just all of a sudden, you know, they just say, oh gosh, you know, they don't become, you know, less smart, okay? So the reality is that the, the, the innovators and entrepreneurs, okay, they always are thinking, but because of during the hardest of the times, since a lot of people have this fear and uh, you know, may, maybe they get concerned, so they don't put their best out in the front. So for all the entrepreneurs and all the investors, this is the time that you have to put the best out in front. And they, you know, like as, uh, you know, Bashara mentioned, there's no shortage of, you know, innovative ideas. And this pandemic, one thing, I mean, it's sh such a short period of time, it brought all the issues, global issues. Take a look at the health system. It doesn't matter whether the health system in the US or, or Asia or all over the world. Was it public health, private health? The, the weakness just became so obvious. I mean, the simple little things, okay? We couldn't get the, the supplies are available, but you couldn't get, get it delivered in time, okay? The ventilators are available, but you couldn't get them, you know, going. You know, ICU are available, but somehow you just could not provision, you know, right then and there. So now the good news is what, because the shelter in place took place all over the world, India, the country shut down, country shut down. Let's tell you, okay, what saved us? The technology, all the tech companies, all of a sudden, okay, so, you know, the way now we, we have learned to live, the way we have learned to learn, and the way we have learned to work. And I think this is going to be, I think people are going to be more, more in tune, more adaptive to that, okay? So working from home, as you know, the businesses are only figuring out how people can work from home and be more, more productive. So now you don't have to be in the same location to get your work done. And of course, you know, I mean, I've always believed that even for entrepreneurs, okay, you can be a 50% company and you can be multi or micro multinational company. And you'll see more of that kind of happening. So entrepreneurs, whether you are in India or whether you're in China or Asia or Australia or UK, Germany, Japan, you know, you, you name it, okay, or Latin America, just just go, go about innovating. The other thing is the capital, okay, a lot of capital is available. There's a 120 billion alone available right now in the U.S. from the VCs to invest. But they're looking for the good entrepreneurs, they're looking for people who have longer term view and more sustainable business they, they can build, okay? Globally, there's more than 200 billion dollars available even in venture capital. So my message to all of you who are entrepreneurs, do not lose heart. Just go because whatever you create today, you build today, of course, it won't be consumed for another couple of years anyway. So by that time, this pandemic will be over and all the, you know, the, the, the normalcy will resume back, back and, uh, you know, the life will be better. So whether you want to innovate in health or you want to innovate in education or you want to help innovate in, in manufacturing, fixing the supply chain or just even, uh, you know, retailing, whatever, online shopping, I think opportunity is all over. Okay, so I'm, I'm very optimistic in that regard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vish. That, that's a, a, a positive outlook, which we can all use these days. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, great companies are often built in difficult times. And uh, I think 
we're already seeing a lot of our younger tech companies and investors behind them pivoting to these new challenges. So uh, absolutely, you know, don't lose heart startups. Uh, so Brenda, uh, if we can come around to you now. So you oversee global trade with Silicon Valley Bank. The bank does a lot of financing, the biggest sort of bank in the world for working with startups. Uh, so what are you seeing when you look out globally uh, in the startup community and the portfolio companies that you're working with? So thank you, Sean. It's great to see you. It's great to see all the panelists. Great to have so many people uh, participating. So I think to answer your question um, at Silicon Valley Bank, I'd love to walk through our state of the markets report for uh, the second quarter of 2020. There's a lot of great data in that. You can actually access that information on svb.com. But I want to highlight a few key uh, points of information from this because I think it will speak to what you said at the start of this, Sean, um, and certainly what the panelists have referenced in terms of you know, many of the great companies were started in the most difficult times. And I think what we're gonna look at speaks to that, but it's also of course been uh, naturally a very difficult time um, on the investing side, certainly um, companies that didn't have runway are starting to really reassess um, where they're at and make some hard choices. So let's just dive into some of the information um, that I have here. And let me just move my screen over so I can find the page. So you can see that this is a great point of data because it looks back um, at past recessions um, and looked at those funds that actually survived and the ones that really performed well. And what you're seeing in the data is that a lot of the companies um, and certainly uh, venture firms, um, experience really makes a difference. And many of the firms um, that you're seeing in the market right now have never experienced um, a recession. So I think that's an important data point uh, to consider because um, during the global financial crisis, um, those obviously who had experience versus those that didn't um, had a better history or rate of returns. Um, in terms of you know, public markets and, and valuations, um, we expect the late stage companies to take a, a, a larger hit um, but uh, I think that time will tell. Um, I, I think it's still a little bit early, um, but historically, uh, many of the late stage deals were the ones were typically the areas where we saw um, uh, larger hits in terms of uh, valuations. Uh, I'm gonna skip forward to just this comment around um, adversity and what it means for innovation. If you look at the, the bottom part of the slide here, you'll see that many of the companies um, on the left were founded during the dot-com crash. Um, the top tech startups founded in the global financial crisis, 35% um, of them were serial entrepreneurs. So this says that, yes, it's a, it's a difficult time, but we fully expect um, to see some great companies um, sort of born out of this. Um, and what's going to happen over the next couple of months, I think is difficult to tell. Um, we've seen a lot of companies really focus on um, preserving cash um, and making some hard decisions, which is not surprising. But I tend to land on the optimist side, um, sort of aligning with what Vish had, had commented about, that great companies have historically um, been formed in, in difficult cycles. So where are we seeing the opportunities? Um, certainly consumer um, and health tech um, that relate to um, activity that can support um, during uh, COVID. So not surprisingly, um, we've seen the biggest boost in food delivery, uh, those supporting remote work and remote learning. Um, and as you would expect, airlines and hotels um, and have been significantly hurt. So no surprise there. And in terms of, um, you know, the health uh, care sector in particular, uh, certainly there will be a, a rise in hospital expenses um, as a result of COVID. I don't think that's a surprise um, to anyone. What that means um, to um, those companies that are in the sector um, I think will play out over the next couple of months. 
Uh, as I mentioned pre previously, um, it, given the environment that we're working in, there are going to be runway and the access to cash is going to be particularly important. So depending on what segment of, of the, the economy you operate in, uh, we think, uh, based on the data that we're looking at, um, that certainly companies that um, are unprofitable, um, it's going to be a tough road ahead. But those companies that have a strong cash cushion and have preserved cash certainly um, will weather the storm in addition to those um, that are in industry segments that tend uh, to benefit. And I'm gonna skip forward in the interest of time. Um, and I'd like to um, talk about dry powder and speak a little bit to the international market. So there's plenty of dry powder out there, um, as you alluded to, Sean, at the beginning of the conversation, waiting to be deployed. Um, certainly FinTech um, is an area that we watch pretty closely uh, within SVB. Um, Pre-COVID, there were a number of um, companies that were acquired. We think the road going forward for fintechs will be more story, story of um, mergers and acquisitions, which is um, no surprise. Um, on the international side, um, I'd like to skip ahead um, to an interesting data point um, in this slide, um, which is an area of, of extreme interest for me because I run the trade business at SVB. And many of the shifts that we saw in global, uh, or many of the shifts um, as a result of COVID to global supply chains actually started happening pre-COVID. So in the data that we are seeing um, in, for example, 15% of US imports um, in February um, were from China. Um, this was as high as 48% back in 2014. So the shifts had actually already started to occur um, uh, pre-COVID, I think you're seeing that accelerate, um, but I think there needs to be time for uh, this to shake out a little bit. So supply chains, no doubt, have been disrupted. Um, I think companies will certainly look for other sources, um, but let's not forget that we work in a networked economy and um, many companies need to keep sources of goods, for example, available from many domiciles. So I believe uh, that you know, while supply chains have been impacted and many companies are changing their approach and their tactics, they still will need to source from trusted suppliers. Um, you won't see historical markets go away. Um, and I believe um, that you know, while there's a lot of conversation in the US about bringing manufacturing back, you can't ignore the fact that companies are multinational, um, business is multinational, and I expect uh, the global world uh, to continue to forge ahead, though the composition of it may be a little bit different based on the current. So I will stop sharing. Again, um, that's data from the SVB uh, that's available on svb.com, and it is our state of the markets report. That's fantastic, Brent. <laughs> Thanks very much. Let me throw a, a question to, uh, to all of you. Um, so much now is moving online, just accelerating trends that had already begun. I've talked to friends at, at, at UCSF and uh, for the last three months, virtually all of their medical appointments have been done online. And what they're saying is they're not going back. You know, something will be done in person, of course, but the as much as possible of their, their medical checkups and appointments will be virtual, and they say it's working just fine. Uh, the other thing that we're noticing is a lot of the Bay Area tech companies and, and life sciences companies, they're collaborating internationally. They're, they're doing research with and clinical tests in partnership with companies in China. They're doing it partners in Europe. So it, it is a, a, a global uh, process we're, we're in the middle of here. It's not just us or one company, but it's very collaborative in all, many cases. So I'm wondering in our last maybe three or four minutes, if uh, you all have any perspectives on sort of the, the global nature of the innovation, uh, the collaborative processes, those opportunities that are being brought to bear, and especially as we look at new things like remote medicine, how, how big is that going to become over time? And how is like the underlying IT uh, 
you know, infrastructure going to drive some of these changes and opportunities? And maybe we've got, I think, three minutes. So uh, long question, but if you can be precise, that'll be awesome. Happy to kick us off here, uh, Sean. Let me uh, confirm to you the, what you're hearing from UCSF, we're also seeing at Kaiser Permanente. We have you know, 12.4 million members across the system. And in April, 80% of our encounters in primary care happen through a remote type of virtual engagement, whether it's phone, video, or um, any type of a remote engagement. And now as the as the in-person visits started going up, we're still at about 63% or so of our encounters happening remotely. And we do continue, that we do expect that this trend will continue. Prior to COVID, about 15% of our primary care encounters happened remotely. It got to 80%, now we're at about 62. And I can assure you that that, that trend will continue. People are liking it, our providers are liking it. You know, I handle most of what I need to handle with Kaiser Permanente through my Kaiser Permanente app. So I, I, I want to confirm that. Fantastic. And that actually, so just a quick follow up on that. Uh, is the technology fine? Or if you said, were to say, I need better technology to do certain things, what, what, what would those new technologies or improved technologies maybe look like? I think for us, we have a long journey of being in this telehealth journey. So what we've seen is our system right now, we've stretched our system to be able to increase the bandwidth, do more, but there'll be lots of opportunity for additional innovation here. So I don't want to take the full three minutes. I'm sure Vish or Brenda would want to weigh in too. We yeah. actually have three more left, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just, I was just uh, uh, echo the sentiment that Bashara, you mentioned, but here, here's the thing that I would suggest. Because, of course, you know, the established organizations like Kaiser, all the other people, so whether it's a healthcare or whether it's a banking system, they're up for major innovation because the system that you guys have, it still does not give a user a, a, a wonderful user experience because you are in a regulated industry, so you have a lot of restrictions, a lot of kind of stuff like that. Okay, so you can only come to my, my system and my side. Why, can, why can't you interact? Why can't if I'm you know you know if I'm with one one doctor and why can't my data can be shipped to another system? Uh, you know it's a big big problem that you have. So uh, bank is the same problem. Okay, you come to my portal. Okay, I can Bank America, Wells Fargo, they they don't interact. Okay, so this is the one that's going to be major, and the, only the entrepreneurs can innovate in that area. And of course, and since you get the big buyers, so you'll be supporting it. But I I see huge innovation opportunity in that. Telehealth is a big thing, but the one one other comment I'll make about telehealth, as it becomes more popular, and the routine and the chronic stuff, you can do telehealth, you don't need to go to the doctor, all that kind of stuff. But also, I think in the the the, the, the country, underdeveloped countries, where they have shortage of physicians, and people, you know, don't have as much access. So I think this is going to permeate a lot more over there also innovation going to come from the west and it's going to permeate you know into the other other part of the world also so i'm very optimistic on on both the front fintech as well as the health tech you know innovation yeah fantastic brenda what do you think um so to your question about the global nature of innovation um i'm very optimistic you know internally what we're seeing in svb i think uh there's um this is um you know a time of disruption and a time of opportunity so Certainly for us internally, um, we're aggressively pursuing strategies that uh, put us at the forefront um, for our clients. Um, and you know what I what we are seeing internally is um, innovation will forge ahead and move forward. I'm I'm very optimistic. I think it's going to be a time where companies with cash um, are able to manage through the cycle. But as we come out of it, I'm very optimistic for what lies ahead. Fantastic. And let's see, I'm looking at my clock. Oh, we have two minutes left and we actually have a question here. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> oh, these. One is for somebody in a different group. Uh, for Brenda, the CARES Act sets aside $425 million for mental wellness, wellness tech, um, aging tech. Uh, and then the, uh, so the question is, is Silicon Valley Bank involved in startups that might be addressing some of these new uh, new fields or increasingly important fields? Uh, yes, absolutely. 
Um, so, um, you know, I can't speak to clients specifically, but broadly mental wellness and aging word that if there's an innovation around uh, any of those that uh, companies that we bank are involved and the investors are certainly so the the short answer is yes um and um i'll just leave it at that Vish, any thoughts on the uh aging tech wellness tech oh yes yeah i've already seen um uh, i've seen companies already they're trying to address the the um uh, the you know the the uh, tech for elderly like nursing homes you know the you know how do you monitor and again and also kind of telehealth okay you got all the sensor all the monitors monitoring the conditions and stuff like that and uh, so that that innovation is is happening already i've seen you know a lot of business plans uh, same thing on the mental you know mental you know illness is a big problem as you know in america and you know, for that matter, other parts of the world also. So there's a lot of innovation occurring in that in that area as well. Okay, and again, the telehealth is, is coming in a big way because uh, uh, there are counselors available uh, for mental health, and um, you know. So uh, yeah, the, both are both are good areas, but uh, the entrepreneurs have to understand the subject matter and domain, and maybe create a company. The uh, you know, we did a forum. Uh, a few weeks ago that involved somebody from uh, the Buck Center for Research on Aging uh, and UTSF. And it was really remarkable. The takeaway was that for the vulnerabilities to COVID-19, it is overwhelmingly linked to aging. So it, it's really a disease of aging primarily if you go back to kind of the underlying vulnerabilities. And so much seems to be tied into the aging process. And so there is some phenomenal research going on around everything to do with that as sort of a driver of how do you address all these diseases. Uh, you can address them one at a time or you can address aspects of the aging process. So some of the deep research going on just here in the Bay Area, I think will, will lead us in a lot of uh, really fascinating new directions. I've been told we've got a couple more minutes longer if we wish to, um, and I don't see any more questions, but would anybody on our esteemed group like to have anything last to say before we uh, uh, wrap this up and turn it back to our, our host at F50? Well, I would say one thing, uh, maybe, and this is since Bashara is over there from the healthcare side, uh, you know, the healthcare industry globally is like $8 trillion industry. Okay, US alone is like $3 trillion, and the rest of the world is another five. And I think this is where the public-private partnership, government, as well as uh, you know, private you know, organizations, you know, the health systems, they really have to think differently because the weakness has, you know, has become glaring, glaringly obvious in the whole system. System is really, um, it just does not work. It is, it, is, it, is, uh, it is broken, okay? It is expensive, it's costly, so much waste. So, and I think that uh, I see that uh, that an overarching, uh, you know, and I think people have become a lot more in tune. Okay, the, the industry is working harder at it, and the uh, the governments are working hard at it. So I see, you know, a, a positive opportunities coming out as a result of this thing, and uh, you know, the, 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 so. To, you know, the, the other one is, is the financial sector. Look at this, the whole PPP, okay? The rapid fire, okay? Our government, you know, got all the trillions of dollars made available, okay? But even the banks, I mean, you, you talk about all the innovation, okay? They got whether it's the Silicon Valley Bank or Wells Fargo or, you know, 8,000 some other banks that we had, okay? They were not able to process this thing in time because so because the regulation. They got, so you'll see also some, some changes in the regulatory stuff also. Uh, and I, I and I hope that our, our lawmakers and the policymakers and uh, and other people operators are going to be paying attention and collaborate in this innovation to do the greater good. Okay. Uh, uh, Sean, I'll, uh, let me just add to what Bush uh, had just mentioned. I think in addition um, to the opportunity in the healthcare system. I really look at this pandemic as an opportunity to get us a silver lining on the public health system as well. Mm -hmm. I think we mostly pay attention to the 
healthcare system because that's where the trillions and trillions of dollars are globally and particularly in the United States. The reality though, is unless we step up our public health infrastructure, public health system, we're gonna face a lot more public health challenges that are gonna disrupt our healthcare system, disrupt our economy, and really our opportunity is to make sure that we're lifting up the resources and the public health infrastructure in this country and in the world. So just want to leave you with that, with that element. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Michelle, that's a great good point. Today. Yes. So yeah. Sean, if I could just have a closing comment. Um, so yeah. SVB did uh, significant work in processing PPP applications and this will be no surprise to anybody. Digitization is certainly an area of focus. Uh, for us and we're ardently working on it. So I think we're addressing some of the things that, that Vish raised. I consider us in a bit of a different ca category um, than the majors, but certainly our clients expect us to move forward in a pretty significant way and we're doing that. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. We love Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> I see Nikolai is back on the screen, which means we are actually out of time. So I, I want to thank everybody, uh, Basara, Vish, Brenda, uh, for this really, really great discussion. I think you've done a great job of kind of setting the conversation for uh, the events that are going to follow over the next couple of days. So we really appreciate your sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Um, and uh, Nikolai, I guess uh, yeah. back to you. Oh my God, that was an amazing talk. Uh, Sean, Brenda, Vish, uh, <laughs> Dr. Bishara. Uh, Super insightful. Special thanks to Brenda for insights from the SPB perspective. It, it was wonderful. Uh, Vish, Sean, uh, Dr. Kushar, you were great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, we need to move to another session. And the